When I was in seventh or eighth grade, I was in my high school library, and I read an article about this person who had come to northern British Columbia and hunted mountain caribou in the Cassiar region. Mountain caribou has been in my mind for so long, for 40 years. This hunt, that is now gonna be reality. Is, is it gonna meet the expectation? I don't know. But I know tomorrow when I get on that plane and fly out for 10 days of mountain caribou hunting, we're going to do this. I know what's going on. <laughs> the excitement of going to do this after 40 years of waiting is the closest I think I can get to Christmas for a five-year-old. I'm sure some of you who are watching this are saying, Randy, all of your stuff for the last 12 years has been self-guided and yeah they have and i bet you going forward for the next 12 years after this they'll probably all be self-guided i could go hunt barren ground caribou i could go other places and hunt caribou without a guide there's something about mountain caribou in northern british columbia that has been this dream and the only way you can do that is with an outfitter Some of you listen to our Hunt Talk Radio podcast. I had Dustin Rowe, who owns this backcountry BC and beyond operation. I had him on the podcast. After that podcast, Dustin and I were talking. He's like, well, what's your real dream hunt? And when I said mountain caribou, he got a smile on his face. I had no idea that Dustin had a mountain caribou operation. I said, you should go do it. I said, yeah, I know I should. This landscape of northern British Columbia and even further north into the Yukon is some extremely wild, untouched country. And when I come to a place like this, it reminds me of how valuable our wild places are. Jump off the front. <laughs> Has everyone got boots on and stuff? Keep going. No, no. Go to hurry up, I'm down. Jim. And we're trying to stay out of everybody's way. They're uh, packing up everything and getting the horses ready. And the idea is we're going to go around these mountains to the next camp. Have you shot a moose before? I shot a moose. But, Wait, uh, never a mountain caribou? Ah, oh, they're not much to look at. <laughs> <laughs> they're probably my favorite thing to look at. They're yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Special place, it's a special time of year. So. Yeah. Jim, you'll probably, you've got kind of a fat horse, so your knees might yeah. hurt a little earlier. 
and you've got that big dappy grey one. So the grey one facing towards us? Yeah. The tallest one. The biggest one, <laughs> yeah. Huh. I'm not a horse person. I've ridden horses before. I've done a few hunts where we've had horses, but I've never hunted from horses like this kind of hunt is. And it was ride horses until dark. Here without trails, the country is so difficult. I, uh, I can't even explain how impressive the landscape is. Just unique it is to any of the hunting I've ever done. I guess there's something about hunting in country that kind of shapes you in a way. The remoteness, the logistics to get here, I, I don't know how you could do it without the aid of capable people like James and Blythe. Little nippy this morning after two inches of snow last night. Prime glass and snow. <laughs> And now we're splitting up. So Braden and Jim are gonna moose hunt somewhere up that way. And James is taking me and Marcus and we're gonna ride a horse another five or six hours that way looking for caribou. This is Chan's right here. But I'm thinking of renaming him Two Dot because the shortest distance between two dots or two points is a line. He goes in a straight line. There's none of the zigzag in it. Uphill, downhill. Um, this is the opposite one then. Because he, if there's these point going to this point, he'll go to that point, to that point, <laughs> to that point, to that point, and then to that point. <laughs> but he won't get his feet wet while he's doing it. Theodore Roosevelt he said only he who has partaken thereof can understand the keen delight of hunting the lonely lands. A lot of hunting stories are written about the Cassiar region where we're hunting right here. One of those stories back when I was in junior high school is what was the incubator for this dream that I had. It spoke of the remoteness and the wildness of the Cassiar. My wife said, you know, since I've known you, you've talked about it. With her encouragement, I said, all right, I'm gonna go do it. I'd say we were on horseback mm, eight, nine hours at least. We did see a, a decent bull. We're driving, riding down the trail, and all of a sudden, a moose just comes. But he came across the trail down below us, and he got downwind of us. And as quick as he got downwind of us, he turned and looked, and he was gone. And Maybe in the lower 48, you say, well, I'd go after that thing. But here, without trails, the country is so difficult to navigate, but no. No, I don't think we'll do much good chasing.
kept going and kept going and then we kept going and so it's gonna be full-blown dark by the time we get into caribou camp oh wow oh jeez and from our right out through these spruce trees comes a herd of caribou and there's two bulls with it and one of them is just you can look with your naked eye and see that he is just remarkable james and i are looking at these caribou he looks at me and he's got this really big look he said he's legal yes i'd shoot that one seem real 40 years and it happened so fast thank you James thanks for grabbing all the yeah, horses when I walked up to him I just I could not believe that that early in the hunt I would encounter a specimen like that. When you said you should shoot that one, that was good advice. <laughs> A great we, went, shot. we went setting up for a prone rest with a stock. I, stock thought, I almost thought he was just looking through his thing. He just went like that. And just, right. oh, checking just, yeah, just checking or something and then boom. It just about wore the blade out from punching tags. Even though this is a guided hunt, I, I want to pitch in and do all I can. Uh, I warned James that when that caribou or moose hits the ground, you just sit back and have a have a break because I'm in charge of the we call it gutting and gilling the field dressing so many things could have went wrong thankfully the years of experience of James knowing what a large caribou looks like Blythe being able to handle all of these horses all by herself this is everything I hoped it would be and I'm thankful that the shot was true going to retrieve the meat, the rest of the meat, from my caribou. And we spent all day the next day taking care of that caribou, the meat, the cape, everything else. James and Blythe are brother and sister and they're, they're quality people. They'll have 90 days in here nonstop in this remote country with no cell phone, no computer, none of the modern conveniences. It takes a, a rugged and determined person to be able to do that. They have interesting stories and they have a maturity beyond their years. We now are not even halfway through the hunt and we're switching from mountain caribou to moose. Well, it is the morning of, I believe, September 29th, whatever day of this 
operation that would be. So now we're gonna load up the horses and we got about an eight hour, nine hour horse ride back to the big camp. They can fly their little plane in and pick up the meat. And then the goal is to focus on a moose. I've got six days to try find a moose. And so we took 10 hours between riding and walking, riding and walking, and saw a few more caribou on the way back. Just as we got back to the main camp, we saw a moose. And James is like, nah, only about 45 inches. And I'm thinking, only about 45 inches? Whew, that's a pretty nice looking bull. But James assured me that, he said, we have five days, we can do better. And the next morning, the idea was, all right, Jim, the other hunter, and Braden are going one way, and me and Marcus will follow James a different direction. Moose, day one, here we go. Bad day to be a moose. <laughs> rain a little bit and then clear off, rain a little bit, clear off. And James looks in the spotting scope and he says, I believe that's the biggest moose I've ever seen here. I'm like, oh, and he's coming our way. <laughs> goody, goody. Was that just to get me excited or was that reality, James? Still looking at him and he's still the biggest moose I've ever seen. We watch the bull turn and he starts heading straight west. And we know that Jim and, and Braden are somewhere on one of those big knobs way out to the west of us. And then all of a sudden, straight to our west, we hear, boom! You know, Jim, the other hunter, and over there, and that's where the shot came from. And a little while later, uh, James gets a message on his in-reach device that says, one very happy moose hunter. I guess we'll just have to look for another one. So we're just riding from glassing spot to glassing spot, using the horses to cover this crazy amount of terrain. And it was raining quite hard. And I looked over and I thought I saw a bull. Same bull as last night. Dang it. I was, for some reason in the rain, I thought he was bigger. All right. The 
I'm breaking a vow. I made a vow to myself after hunting for 10 miserable rainy days in Alaska one time that I don't hunt in the rain. But Marcus gives me no choice, called me a whole bunch of names because, wow, who, who's afraid to go and hunt in the rain? Those are mighty big rain pants you have there, Marcus. Yeah. My what big <laughs> rain pants you have. So, Marcus forgot rain pants on this trip. And by some miracle of good fortune, the fellow hunter in camp, our buddy Jim, who shot the big moose yesterday, happened to have a pair of Sitka Open Country Optifade rain pants in a size XL, and Marcus is a size small. <laughs> so, Marcus looks like he ran away from home and just grabbed whatever he could. But we better go do this before I change my mind and say I'm not going to violate my oath of not filming and hunting in the rain. It just kept pelting rain all night long. The forecast was for rain the next two or three days. You know, it's 38, 40 degrees Fahrenheit and it's raining and the humidity level is super high. We took this trail way up, kind of the direction towards where Jim had shot that bull the day before. Finally, the, the cloud cover's high enough, but it's still mist and rain and wind. Right away, Jim says, there's a fine bull over there. I'm like, where? Oh, way over there. James turns to me and says, are you ready for a hike? And I said, yeah, that's what I came here for. And it's exactly the same ridge where we'd lost sight of the big bull the day before that Jim ended up shooting. And we're thinking, what are the odds of two really big bulls there? And James keeps calling and I'm laying there in the prone position thinking, well, this could be a while, I better get comfortable. And about a half hour later, all of a sudden, I see an antler on the horizon. I'm like, hey guys, he's just to the right of that meadow. And with this crazy wind and everything, I'm like, oh, I'm not chancing that shot. He, the bull turns and he heads kind of uphill and away from us. And James is like, come on, let's catch him. I mean, how are you gonna catch up to a moose running through this country? Take a couple of breaths and James is like, just take your time, but don't shoot unless you're comfortable. <sighs> Get there. And I put another shell in. Well, I jack another round in and now he disappears behind another depression and he's way, way out there. I can't see him, he went out of sight. 
and I stand up on this little tussock and I'm like, <sighs> take my time and Fine if you can. Ooh. I think he's expired. Yep. <sighs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a rodeo. I wish I could tell you that, you know, the first shot he just fell, but he didn't. The first shot hit him right on the point of the shoulder and went in and the autopsy showed it got one lung. Any of you who hunt know that once you hit an animal, you're doing everything you can to finish the job. You want to finish it as quickly as possible. Well, this moose we've been chasing all day, he made an appearance at 470 yards and then he started coming this way. And he comes out, and here was where Jim shot his bull yesterday. You can see they've got it all carved up and the horses here. And that bull that I ended up shooting at comes and stands right up here. Well, Jim, where's your bull? Right there. Where? Oh, wow. Let's see some show and tell. Oh, that's Great mistake. That's a heap big Canada moose there, folks. Unfortunately, I'm sure everyone's gonna see the pictures of the, of the bull and they're gonna be like, oh, you got excited and shot him in the antler, huh? Well, sometimes when they're running away. The longest time on the driver's side is busted off about that far. So I'm, I'm standing there admiring this bull just in awe. Thank you, big buddy. Thank you. And I look over, and about 15 feet away, not even, it, it, it's this far off the ground in the alders. It got hung up in some alders. I'm like, that looks like a broken tine. say when you score it, if you can find the missing piece, yeah. Yeah. it counts. Now, I don't know how you go about that. <laughs> Hold it up there about four inches higher. There you go. I yeah, think that's we'll go <laughs> Get some buck rush. <laughs> 300 doesn't <laughs> yep. Obviously, I got a good ribbing over it. Uh, and, you know, I should have made a better first shot. Uh, or, we should have just stayed over the bowl and waited for him to expire because I'm, I'm sure he wasn't going to make it too much longer, but I just, I don't want to see an animal lay there and I want to finish the job as quickly as possible, regardless of how difficult the shooting conditions are and the weather and everything else. And if you shoot off a tine, I guess you shoot off a tine. Blythe had heard the shooting and here she comes trailing our four horses down the trail. That's a beauty. We even found that piece. You found it? Yeah, it was right here. <laughs> <laughs> now everybody's got horses and we got pack horses and we're, we're sat now. And it was a very exciting moment for everybody. It was a lot of laughs and smiles and everyone's pitching in while we're cutting and carving on this bull and we got it taken care of in record time.
And the guys, they're like, well, here's how we're gonna have to do it. We're gonna be fully loaded with Jim's bull, plus some of your meat and your antlers and his antlers and his cape and all of us. It's gonna be a rough ride out of here. got back to camp that night and everybody is soaked. Everybody's just still smiling. <sighs> I'm thoroughly exhausted, but I can't even imagine how exhausted this crew is. They're up at daylight, way past dark, taking care of horses. Just, <laughs> it is so remarkable to see that team in action. You just gotta come here and experience it to really understand it. But this can be really overwhelming for a lot of people. I don't know what you It could be. Like you get halfway into that little like we did today and you think, this isn't for me. Yeah. But <laughs> I hate I hate this. Yeah. And it's very nice. Yeah. And, and then cool. and then some people it's just the worse it gets, the bigger the small <laughs> becomes. And it's like, I can't explain it, and I know I'm one of them. And you cannot beat good luck. And I had a ton of good luck. I, I could tell by the chatter among James and Braden and the two Wranglers, Blythe and Marty, that this was an unusual five days. That it does not usually fall together this good. And we've all had those other hunts where it seems like we've done everything, we've planned, we've worked hard, we've done every possible preparation. And we, we end up with nothing, not even an encounter. There's the, the tenderloin cooker right there. My mind rolls back to probably, I don't know, 1977 or 78, when I first read an article in an outdoor magazine about mountain caribou hunting in the Cassiar region. Hard to believe a 14 year old snotty nosed kid from Big Falls, Minnesota, could spend days thinking about that. And here I am breathing that air standing on that wet, spongy ground, looking at these snow-covered peaks. And I'm just grateful for everyone who made it possible. This crew here in, in Dustin Row, the outfitter, uh, for my wife who just encouraged me to go follow this dream. I'm so lucky to have so many people that helped, helped it happen. And hopefully I'll have four new friends that I can run into at trade shows or whatever and we can tell big stories about September and October of 2019 in the Cassiar Mountain. We all have dreams. You have a dream. Go do that because you're not gonna regret it. You're gonna ask yourself, why did I wait this long? I'm not sure about this lake trout fishing operation. We need more than hopes and wishes. Oh, holy mackinac! Woo! Through the night. Oh, damn it! Oh, what do you got there, Mark? Oh, my goodness. That thing is just burning the bearings out of that thing. Holy cow. If you didn't know better, you'd think that was an Okeechobee big mouth bass or something.
Holy cow, that thing is big. <laughs> Hold on, don't horse him yet. He's, good. He's not played out. He'll go right there. You just wait till he rolls a little bit. Keep him upside down. Upside. And you throw him up on the bank. <laughs> Dang, that's a pretty nice one. That's huh? heavy duty. Woo! Guess we we'll can keep him, huh? Give me that camera. See right there? Look at that great big thing.